everyone, welcome to Church Online. We are so glad that you could join us today. My name is Megan and I'm a pastor on staff here and I have the privilege of hosting the service today. For those of you that don't know, we are one church in three locations. So if you're ever able to join us in person, we would love for you to check out one of our campuses in Westland, Milwaukee, or Beaverton. In the meantime, we'd love to meet you and help you get connected. The best way to do that is to click on one of the links below or check out our website. Our mission as a church is to inspire people to know, love, and follow Jesus. We absolutely love our local communities and wanna do whatever we can to help make a difference in the world as we learn what it means to follow Jesus together. I hope you'll find today's message challenging and encouraging, so let's lean in and engage. My name is Paul, and I, for the last 18 years, uh, was in private practice. I had a um, counseling uh, practice where I worked primarily with trauma, childhood abuse recovery, those kind of things. And then the second half of my career, I actually shifted over to a lot of uh, marriage and relationship stuff. I did the math, and um, 13, 14,000 hours sitting with individuals, learning their stories, helping them walk through this, um, probably 1,200 uh, clients, uh, individuals and couples. Um, it's given me a, a wonderful and um, I call it a sacred privilege <clears throat> to hear people's stories and where they are coming from and they would entrust me with some of the things that were the most difficult in their lives as they are trying to change as they're trying to become healthier. They don't want to be held captive by either um, sins that were done against them, again, childhood trauma, or sins that they have been doing in terms of how to survive and how to just kind of cope with life, or sins that you're just even in proximity to. Um, doing therapy, doing that kind of work is hard work and takes a lot of courage. And so, again, like Grant said, some of you are here because of um, your own journey. Some of you are here because you have friends who are going through this journey. Some of you are here because you want to help other people professionally go through this journey. Or you might be here because you just didn't want to listen to Brian in the service. So whatever it is, we're glad that you're here. Sound all right? Um, my wife is going to pass out a few handouts really quick here as we get started, but I wanted to start in the 1970s because the 70s is always a great place to start. How many of you enjoyed the 70s? Don't answer that question, okay? Oh man, the 70s were hard. Um, this is not me, okay? I pulled this picture off of the internet just because my mom has all of the pictures down in San Diego, but I, that could have been me. In the 70s, we had that exact couch. We had that exact brown carpet. I'm pretty sure we had that exact lamp and that exact end table. I think everyone in the 70s had the exact same decor. How many of you had something in that ballpark that was like, yep, that looks familiar? See, uh, it's like everyone has the same stuff from 19, between 70 and about 78. The reason I pulled this picture up is not because of the couch, not because of the lamp, not because of the weird card game or whatever's going on on the table there is, it's the curtains. The curtains in the back, we don't see them very often uh, nowadays, um, but it's the old school curtains where uh, the curtains open and close this way and there's usually string on one side that you pull, everyone get those, everyone has blinds nowadays. It's like those kind of curtains are out of fashion because again, it's 1970s, who wants to have the 70s back? Um, so you pull this little string and these curtains open and close, open and close. And you're going, okay, what in the world does this have to do with addiction? Why is he talking about the 70s and curtains? Because curtains, um, I call it the feelings curtains. This is where we're going to start because addiction is all about feelings. And I'm going to connect all the dots here for you. Um, I want you to picture these curtains here. And as they open and close, on this this side of the curtains um, is all of the painful feelings. And when you start in the middle, it's just kind of subtle bad feelings. You know, I just kind of d disappointed and then sadness and then anger and then rage and then, you know, intensity. It becomes more and more intense as you go out. So everyone tracking with me? And on the other side of the curtains are positive feelings, okay? So, you know, joy and happiness and ecstatic and rapture and all this. And so as you get further out on the curtains, it's more intense. And as you get towards the middle, um, it's just kind of less intense. 
Here's why we're talking about feelings curtains. When people have experiences or feelings that they don't like, usually on the negative side, they take these curtains and they go, I don't want to feel these bad feelings anymore. So they pull a little string and shh, they close that side of the curtain. So I don't have to feel those bad feelings anymore, right? But what happens? You can't close one side. Shh, this side also closes. And then you go, man, there's more feelings I don't like. Shh, I'm going to close these off. Shh, this side closes. And as you spend your life going, because I don't want to feel these painful feelings. I don't want to feel sad or guilt or remorse or embarrassment or shame or whatever this is. I don't like all these terrible feelings. I'm going to try to close these curtains as much as possible so that I don't have those bad feelings anymore. And you, sh you end up closing these positive feelings as well. And you start to live in this very narrow area where you just don't want to feel anything. And life's just kind of gray. And so you can't even find happiness, you can't even find joy, but you also have done a good job of not feeling the pain. You haven't felt any of those negative feelings. Addiction, substances, behaviors, stuff is one of the best ways you can come up with to not feel this bad stuff anymore. All addictions are about mood alteration. I'm gonna say it again. All addiction is about mood alteration. I don't like what I feel here. I can do or, or participate in this thing here and I now feel something different. Isn't that lovely? And a lot of people, um, they learn how to do these things early on in their lives because it's the only thing that's available to them. And they go, oh, it works. I'm gonna keep using it and I'm gonna keep doing it over and over again. And then it's no longer about trying to avoid feelings anymore. Now they start to have chemical, um, when you start to create habits like that, your brain gets used to those neurochemistry and everything like that. It's like, ooh, I want more of that. And so you now have a secondary problem. It's called comorbidity, okay? Just write that down. Use it at a party. People will think you're smart, okay? Comor comorbidity of, and now I got this and this problem to deal with. And then I got this one and this one and this one. And they kind of start stacking on top of each other. Feelings curtains. Everyone making sense with that? That's why we're talking about the 70s here. What I want to show you is, um, since all addiction is about mood alteration, I thought I would walk you through what the addiction cycle looks like. For some of you, this is like, oh, I've already been there, but this is actually a little di a different addiction cycle. It's going to be, uh, I want you to see where you can identify yourself on this process. Uh, for others, you're going to go, man, that's exactly what I've been through, or that's what my family member is going through. And it's actually the handout that you have right there in your, in your hand. All life, I haven't been able to figure this out yet. This is what I actually was working hard on as being a therapist, was trying to figure out the very first box on the left, how to avoid pain. I haven't figured it out yet, okay? This is where uh, the princess bride, life is pain princess, remember that scene? Okay, if I could just figure out how to not have people hurt anymore, then it's like, man, I'd, I'd write that book and retire, basically. I could just kind of relax. But I haven't figured that out yet. Can we all agree that life has pain that we just don't know what to do with sometimes? Everyone tracking with me? Lovely. Sometimes that pain is caused by us, and sometimes that pain is caused by other people's decisions. Can we also agree on that? We don't like those feelings, do we? It's like, oh, man, I'm out of control. I hate that. Here's how it starts to work. When we have pain, unavoidable human condition, we have two options. We can choose the healthy path or we can choose an unhealthy path. The healthy path means we learn how to cope or effectively deal with something difficult. There's actually another term for it. It's called adulting. Isn't that terrible? But think about it. I mean, common, common sense says um, when you're a little kid, the biggest problem you have is what color socks do you want to wear? Okay, do I, do I like these ones because they're itchy and scratchy? Or do I like these because they're smooth and soft? Do I like pink? Do I like yellow? Do I like red? What do I want to go out and play with my friends? We don't have major life decisions or problems that we typically have to solve, right? And as you get older, the decisions get harder and harder. The problems get bigger and bigger, right? Everyone tracking with me? And as you start to deal with those problems, you start to build resilience. I always talk about kind of the, the emotional um, gym, the emotional workout. So if you go into the gym and you're going, I'm going to hire a personal trainer and I want them to help me get stronger. I, I got to lose some weight. I want to build some muscle. And so I'm going to hire this person. And so they go, fantastic. I'm going to introduce you something called um, a weight bench. You're going to lay on that thing. I'm going to put this bar above your head and you're going to start doing bench presses like this. If, 
after the first five minutes, you're going, man, this bar is heavy. I, I don't like doing this. And the guy goes, oh, okay, we'll take off a little bit of weight. We, we don't want you to be uncomfortable here. Are you going to build any muscle? Not at all. The whole idea is we're actually going to add more and more weight as you get stronger and stronger. It builds resilience. That's one of the consequences of learning how to cope. By the way, coping is a healthy appropriate word. There is inappropriate coping mechanisms, but coping is actually a good thing. You want to have effective dealing with problems. And so that builds resilience, that builds strength, that builds maturity, and that builds wisdom. So that when you become an adult, you have all those things. And if you're parents, you're trying to pass those exact same things on to your kids. Can we agree? We don't want 38-year-olds still living in our basement having to tell them what to wear. We don't want to make their bowl of cereal in the morning. We want them to be able to handle bigger and bigger problems as they get older. The unhealthy um, way of dealing with pain is to avoid. I'm going to uh, attempt to provide psychological comfort by just not even going into the gym. I'm not even going to lift the bar. I'm not even going to ask someone to teach me how to carry heavy, heavier weights. And when you do that, you end up being fearful. You, again, weakness. It's not character weakness. It's just um, you don't have as much capacity to handle heavier problems or bigger issues. Uh, immaturity um, and then reactive. For those who are familiar with addiction, for those who are familiar or have family members or you work with people, you don't, please don't raise your hands. You don't need to do that. But how many of those um, four characteristics right there uh, do you see in individuals who are struggling with any sort of addiction in some way? It just keeps showing up, doesn't it? It's like, dang, how come we can't figure that out? Um, the path, the path to get healthy, believe it or not, is actually pretty simple. It is saying, I recognize that I have started to avoid or I've learned to avoid, and I'm going to now intentionally come down here to recovery, which says I'm willing to choose to face the unresolved pain of my past. What are the things that I've been trying to avoid in the first place? What, ha what have I not dealt with? And then you go back to the starting point, but you take the left turn and go to the top there and you start dealing with it in a healthy way. Sometimes you can't do that on your own. Sometimes you need someone to actually train you and teach you. That's what parents are for, by the way. I actually have a 19-year-old son. I got four kids. My youngest is 19. And he's a very capable, competent person, but he's actually doing a job um, in downtown Portland right now. And we live in the suburbs in Clackamas. Um, Two very different worlds, right? Would you agree on that? And so he's going, Dad, where do I park down there? I mean, what do I do? How do I navigate all of that? And he doesn't know. He just hasn't been exposed to all that because he hasn't had a job downtown before. And so he is having to learn how to find a parking structure, how to use the ticketing system, how to park in a way so you don't get your windows broken out and your bags stolen, how you walk down the street and make sure you're not going to get assaulted or all of the different uh, dangers, all the different uh, things you have to navigate, which are different from Clackamas, which is a different place. And I get to train him how to do that. So here's what you do. Here's all the steps you take. And now that I've guided him through that, and he did it for the first time yesterday, he came back and he goes, oh, I know what it looks like now. Today's no problem. He's gonna, he can go down there easily and do that because he's been exposed to it. But he's had someone kind of guide him and walk him through all those things. Sometimes when you first grew up or you started to deal with your stuff, you didn't have anyone who showed you the better option right? And you're just kind of figuring things out on your own. And again, you've picked the thing that worked best for you. When you move down this recovery path, you actually do need someone to say, hey, there's actually a different option. You don't have to steal or rob or, you know, this is where you park your car, this is where you'll be safe, and this is how you can navigate walking to wherever you need to get to, and I'm going to walk, guide you through some of that. Again, the problem that happens, the resistance we have is we go, but I'm an adult and I don't want to look silly. I don't want to look immature. I don't want to have to ask for help. I want to be able to figure this out on my own. It's that pride thing that gets in the way. And so being able to humble yourself and go, I'm going to go back and I'm going to let someone show me how to do this. Fun little uh, trivia thing here. Um, did you know there's uh, two kinds of addiction, okay? There are substance addictions and there are behavioral addictions, Thank you so much. Uh, substance addictions and behavioral addictions. If you're going to pick an addiction, pick a substance addiction. You get a choice, okay? 
Uh, substances, uh, common sense, so uh, alcohol, drugs, anything that uh, you put into your, your system and it changes you uh, chemically, it, again, alters your, your blood toxicity and things like that, and it, and it makes you feel different. Uh, behavioral addictions are the things that you do and you actually become addicted to your own neurochemistry, your own brain chemistry. So uh, pornography, uh, that's not a substance you're putting into your system, but because of the images you're seeing, because of the experience you're having, your brain is now releasing all sorts of amazing neurochemistry things going on and you actually become addicted to that feeling. And it's like, oh, because it's something called the law of diminishing returns, you want a little bit more every time, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And again, things that fall into the behavioral thing is uh, pornography, work, okay, workaholism. I get kudos, I get some sort of accolades. Eating is actually not a substance addiction, it's a behavioral addiction. It's like, I know that I can do this thing, and it will make me feel different. It's not because of the Cheetos you're eating or uh, the chocolate. By the way, chocolate is not addictive. Chocolate's a healthy coping mechanism, okay? Just be clear on that. Um, other eating disorders are a problem, but chocolate's okay. I have to justify my own behaviors here sometimes. Um, uh, what other behavioral things? Uh, sex, okay, uh, sex is a huge uh, behavioral thing. Video games is the newest one, phones, oh my goodness. There's a whole new industry coming out right now. So people who are just becoming therapists are gonna spend probably 30% of their time, in my opinion, dealing with um, uh, technology addiction because it's getting started so, so early. And all the issues, I'm, I'm watching too many parents whose kids are at that, that important critical developmental stage where they need to have that bonding, those, that visual connection, and the moms or the dads flipping on the screen and they're not even connected, so we now have attachment issues. We now have, it's gonna be a big thing. That's, it's gonna be a mess. So uh, video games, avoidance, uh, those kind of things. Um, the reason I say you, you want a, a substance addiction rather than a behavioral addiction is uh, substance addictions, the option of dealing with it is abstinence. You can go the rest of your life without cocaine and probably live a pretty healthy life. Can we agree? You can go the rest of your life and never have another drink and you can be okay. You can still thrive as a human being. Abstinence is an option. Behavioral addictions uh, abstinence is never an option. It's moderation. You can't go, you can't turn off your sexuality. We are sexual creatures. We are built that way. You can't just say, I'm going to completely turn that off. You can't stop eating. You have to learn how to moderate that. You can't stop working or, or else you're going to, you know, struggle with just paying your bills. So you have to learn how to moderate. Behavioral addictions tend to be a little bit harder to overcome or deal with than substance addictions. Now, they, again, chemistry, all the other things, there's, there's real things that are happening in there which make it difficult either way. But um, you can start to notice that people are, are when they're either behavioral or, or substance, they can kind of play with some of those things. Why in the world do I have a golf club in my hand? It's kind of odd, isn't it? This is your brain, okay? For those who are curious, this is your brain. Uh, brain usually has uh, kind of three areas. This is the, uh, it's called the reptilian brain. It's that core. It's deep, deep inside your brain. And this is your brain stem that goes up and connects to the kind of the uh, part of your brain here. This part of your brain is responsible for um, survival, this is uh, called reptilians because this is what snakes and lizards have. All they care about is um, food, safety, shelter, and reproduction. Besides that, snakes and lizards just don't really care. For those who um, have reptiles as pets, that pet snake or that pet lizard, I've got bad news for you. You have not bonded with that pet. It doesn't like you. It doesn't care about you. It doesn't know who you are. It, it, it doesn't have an emotional connection to you. It has a behavioral connection in terms of if you feed it, it knows it's probably not good to bite you. So it, you can train it, but it doesn't have an emotional bond. That's because snakes and lizards pretty much only have this part of their brain. You have the next part of your brain, which is uh, sometimes called the, the mammalian brain. This is what mammals have, so dogs, cats, horses, these kind of things. That part of the brain is developed. It's kind of the next layer up. This is where relationship and emotions kind of live. And this is why you can actually have a dog that does actually like you. It's not just because you feed it food, but because you know it, it can emotionally connect to you. You can, have, you can connect to a horse. By the way, if you guys ever get a chance to do equine therapy, oh, please go do it any chance you get. It is spooky how 
cool it is. Man. Um, they use horses because horses um, operate on this level here and they interact with you not upon the words you're saying or the cognitive piece, but it's upon how you hold yourself and the energy you're holding and the emotions you're carrying. Horses are like, they can, they can read all that and they'll interact with you. It is just brilliant. But mammal brain here is what relationship is. And then finally, you have what's called the neocortex. This is your thinking part of your brain. This is what humans have. Um, and this is where we make decisions from. This is where um, time is measured. Again, your dog and your cat doesn't, can't measure time. You can't say, hey, we're going to work on something three weeks from now. Can I schedule an appointment? They don't care. They, they can't measure time. But humans can measure time. Um, they can make decisions. They can... Um, rationally think about things. What I want you to be aware of is a lot of times um, when you approach addiction, you're looking at someone going, you're making a bad decision and you're talking to this part of the brain here. Why did you make that decision? It's a bad decision. You should have made a better decision. The problem is, is that's not the part of the brain that they're making the decisions with. You're making the decisions with that survival brain down here because I am in pain and I've learned something that stops it. And now I'm operating out of the pieces here, the uh, amygdala, the, the piece of the, neurochem the neurochemistry, the brain that, that says, this is how I'm gonna survive. And that's why it's so hard to talk someone out of addiction. So often we go, let me just put, point out the facts to you and you're going to change. You're gonna thank me. I'm just gonna tell you why you're making such bad decisions. Anyone who has an addiction, does that work? Again, don't raise your hand, okay? But it never works because you're talking to the wrong part of the brain here. And a lot of people go, because I can't make a good decision, I must have bad character. I must be struggling, and so I must be a bad person. And that's where shame comes in. That's what we're talking about week three is gonna be shame. And a lot of times people end up in addictive behaviors because they're trying to cope with childhood pain or just things that are happening early on. That's next week, okay? So we're kind of covering all three aspects of this in these labs. So come back. Next week, you're gonna hear Sherry. Uh, and then the week after that, you're gonna hear Teresa uh, kind of walk you through those, through those things. Everyone tracking with me so far? Is this kind of making sense? Again, this is not group therapy. We're not going to have you tell your, tell your stories. And again, for one hour, we're not going to have a chance to dig into the deep areas here. But I want you to give you a framework to help you understand how you can start navigating through some of this and actually how faith can kind of integrate into some of this because the faith piece is um, essential as you kind of walk through some of this. Um, I came across a, a statement the other day. It says, substance abuse and addiction treatment helps to take off the rose-colored glasses and give you the tools needed to face the world again as an adult. See that happening here? The rose-colored glasses, I'm going to go deal with the pain, and I'm going to kind of deal with that. Um, oh, another little fun uh, fact, which is kind of neat. Um, it's kind of understood um, that when you introduce a, an addictive behavior or substance into your life is when you typically stop to grow emotionally. So biologically, you can have someone who's 30, 40 years old, but if they started using alcohol at 13, they stopped growing emotionally at 13. Does that make sense? Again, why? Why does that happen? Because instead of learning how to deal with and, and create more uh, strength and resilience and deal with bigger problems, they learned how to avoid. They, never, they, they stopped going to the, that emotional gym at that point. They haven't had a chance to practice those things. And that's why for a lot of individuals who are struggling with addiction and trying to work through that process, they're actually dealing with it in a much more um, Im immature brain. They're just their, their skill set and their way of seeing life is, is not the way an adult sees life. Everyone tracking with me? So if you're going, wow, okay, why is this person behaving this way? Or why do I behave that way? When did I first find that alcohol in my, in my dad's liquor cabinet? When did I first come across this thing? When did I come first get exposed to that thing? Oh, and then what is the decision uh, making styles of someone at that age? Wow, I, it's starting to make sense for me. We tend to get stuck emotionally at the age when the addictions start to creep in. Here's, what's, here's what we're going to do for the rest of the time here. We're going to look at Hebrews. This is Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 13, uh, 12, actually. Therefore, 
Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're going to dissect this a little bit because this is just packed with amazing, amazing things. We're going to start with the very first word, therefore. When I went to school, um, I always learned to ask the question, what is it there for? What is it talking about? Because this is a second half of the statement. There's something that comes before it. And for those who are familiar with Hebrews, this is Hebrews 12. Hebrews 11 is called the, the faith chapter. It has a list of about 20 people who have gone through unbelievably hard and difficult things in their life. They have struggled. They have, um, uh, they have tried to, uh, oh, shoot, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, they've been uh, tortured, they've been beaten, they've, they've struggled, and they did not uh, get what they wanted. And everyone's going, that doesn't sound very fun. Why would I want to sign up for that? But it's true. They didn't get what they wanted. And then you have this passage. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... It's going, all these people that we just heard about, all these people, in fact, the last verse in Hebrews 11 says, um, here's all these people, they did not get what they were hoping for in this life, but they got something better in the next. That's, that's a Paul paraphrase. That is, that's the whole context for this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by all these people who are going through all this difficult stuff like us, you are not alone in this. And the fact that you are struggling with pain I hear that a lot with addicts. Why is it so unfair? Why do I got to do this hard thing? Why doesn't someone else got the life that I have? Why? And you got to start to challenge that mentality. Life is pain. There are struggles. And for some people, it is this version of that pain. For other people, it's this version of pain. We get to have our own different styles of pain. But because we have our own pain, you are not alone. Since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. See how that connection happens? I'm in pain. I don't want to be having this. And now I'm doing something coping and it's got me stuck. I am now, I'm now hindered by this. See the path that, is, that this passage is taking? It's pretty fascinating. Um, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Um, let's go here. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why do we have that passage? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because again, there's another recipe here. Once you read it and understand it, there's a recipe here. Um, Timothy Keller, he is a pastor, uh, was a pastor uh, in New York. He has a phrase, idolatry means turning a good thing into an ultimate thing. Alcohol is benign. It's not moral and immoral. It's what we do with it. Sex is benign. It's what we do with it, which makes it healthy or unhealthy. Work, it's benign. None of these things have a moral attribute to it. Stand alone. In fact, I, I've heard it said that that is what Satan has done. He's taken God's beautiful creation. Everything that he created was good. And he found a way to taint it, to twist it, to make it something that is no longer just a, a common thing, but it becomes an ultimate thing. And you will hear again in the phrasing and the people talking about addiction where it says, if I don't get this thing, substance or behavior, I'm going to die Hear the ultimate language there? It is, it's the thing that I depend upon. It's the thing that I think about the most. It's the thing that I want to have the most. I have to get whatever that is. And so when that ultimate thing uh, becomes an idol in your life, you get distracted by the thing that's the most important. That's why it says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus we have to be able to change that perspective and say, whatever this thing is, this thing that's now become this ultimate thing in my life, I have to replace that with something else that's going to be more sustainable and, and better. Now again, how to do that? That's an important question, and we're not covering that in today's thing. I'm just giving you the framework of kind of how to get out of this. But 
it's easier said than done. Look, can we, we'll just be honest about that. Me just saying, stop wanting alcohol and start wanting Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for having us here. We appreciate it. That's not, that's not how it works. That's a process. You have to reprogram your brain. You have to work through that. You got to have people who are going to help you with that. But that's the recipe. That's how to get better. Back to that metaphor with working out um, in the gym. It's not that difficult for your personal trainer to say, lay on the bench, grab the bar, do that once. That's not too complex, is it? But when the weights are heavy, when you're tired, when your muscles are exhausted, just doing that feels really, really hard. That's why you have a spotter there who's going to make sure you don't get hurt doing that. I'm going to hear this support you. I'm going to hear encourage you. You're not going to do this alone. You're not going to get injured, but I'm going to make you do hard stuff. That, that hard stuff thing, again, is what, if we go back to that model before, that resilience and that strength, that maturity, it takes maturity to say, I'm going to do something hard because it's good for me. It's actually a fun little phrase. Um, again, we got four kids, and growing up, I used to have to dis discipline them all the time. Don't do this. No, you can't have cookies before dinner. No, you can't stay up till 1230 because it's a school night. No, 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 no. You can't do all these things. I had to provide that discipline for them, right? When you get older and you move out of the house, you're supposed to be self-disciplined. Someone else isn't going to tell me what I should or shouldn't do. I'm going to tell myself. I'm going to learn how to tell myself no. And that's the hardest thing for addicts to do. I'm going to learn how to tell myself no because it's not good for me. Again, it's a simple re recipe. Doing it in real life is much, much harder. But we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, not the thing that became this ultimate thing in our life. Uh, because he's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And then again, here's the recipe. I love it. The scripture just tells us how and what to do. For the joy set before him, that's an important phrase. For the joy set before him, actually I highlighted it there, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he had the ultimate vision. He just didn't go, I'm going to go to the cross because I'm just going to go to the cross. He knew there was a better purpose. He knows there's a bigger purpose. He, know, he knew that doing something hard and difficult was going to have a much better outcome. If you can teach individuals who struggle with addiction, that concept right there. Say no now because something better later. That's so hard for people struggling with addiction because they haven't learned how to deal with their pain yet. See how this all kind of circles around? Is anyone tracking me? Okay, that's great. Um, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. There it is. Isn't that amazing again? Even Christ had to deal with shame. That should put a whole new spin on your brain. Christ deal with shame? What? Yeah. He scorned it. He didn't, he didn't own it. He didn't, he didn't let it settle in his life. He sat down at the right hand of God, at right hand of the throne of God. Um, there it is, scorning a shame. Here's something interesting, um, and I've always played this uh, game with my clients. Uh, great, good timing. Um, let's say you guys all have your own thing, your own addiction, the whole thing you have a hard time saying no to. We're not going to ask you what it is, but just imagine whatever that thing is. And if I could guarantee you right now that you would not struggle with doing that behavior or taking that substance for the next year, I can guarantee you that right now. I really can. How many would say, I'm going to sign up for that program? 100% success rate. Yeah, let's do that. You want to know what that is? I'll give you the recipe. You guys can decide what you want to do with it. Um... I'm going to take a check, and I'm going to put your name on it, and I'm going to put $45 million paid to the order of so-and-so. And at day 366, a year and one day, that check is yours. I'm going to hang it on my wall. If, and if you have not done whatever the thing is that you're struggling with, $45 million is yours. How many of you would go, I want to give it a shot. Sign me up. I'll, I'll give that a try. Again, it's the, it's the best recovery program ever. I don't know how long it would last. I don't know how it's going to be funded, but it would work. <laughs> Do you notice what's happening inside when you even, even think about that? Wow, that'd be, I could go a year without chocolate. I could go a year without being on my phone. I could go a year without uh, alcohol or, or whatever it is. Because 45, what can I do with $45 million? Wouldn't that be amazing? Oh my gosh, that'd be fun to kind of play with. Here's what's ironic. That's the exact choice we are all sitting in right now. 
if you are a believer, if you follow Christ, and I'm not going to assume that everyone in here is, but this is the invitation that, that Christ offers to us. He goes, this is a fallen world, and it's filled with pain, and it's filled with hurt, and it's filled with struggle, and I've got something better over here for you. In fact, it's so good, I came down and gave my life for it. Will you trust me? Will you believe me that you can, you can uh, not have to numb your pain now because you have a future that is much, much better? This is actually 1 Peter. For, for, for uh, people who study 1 Peter, you have an inheritance that is unfading, undefiled, waiting for you. Unfading, undefiled, waiting for you. And when we start to understand that, when we start to believe that, when we start to tangibly get our brains wrapped around that, then you can start to go, wait a second, okay, I can have a drink now and I can feel good for the next 20 minutes or I can step out in faith and I know this thing over here, I don't want alcohol to be my ultimate thing. I want Christ to be my ultimate thing. I have a joy and a hope that's set out before me. I have to live by faith on that. Again, you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses as this. Hebrews 11, here's all these people who had to make those decisions because they didn't get to see what they were hoping for. You're in the same journey as everyone else is, as the big hitters or the big boys in scripture. This is the human condition but the joy is the same. The hope is the same. The check is waiting for you at the end. If you can just get your head wrapped around it, you can see it. You can kind of understand it.